Okay, here we go with chapter four. Remember we ended in chapter three with them spending their very first night in the bed at the museum. They went to bed hungry. They didn't eat dinner. They didn't brush their teeth. And so Claudia says to Jamie, as they're going to bed, um, tomorrow will be a better day. We'll be better organized. So in chapter four, we know that we're going to dive a little bit deeper into their daily life at the museum, what they're going to do every day. Okay. Page or er, chapter four is a longer chapter. So make sure that you are staying with me. I'll do lots of updates as I'm reading, reminding you where we are in the book. It's super important that you follow along with me in chapter four because there's lots of pictures in chapter four and there's lots of very specific details in chapter four. So you need to make sure that you are following along with me. And like I said, I'll do lots of updates as I'm reading on where I am. Okay. <clears throat> All right, chapter four starts on page 43. So go ahead and get to page 43. I'm gonna wait a couple seconds to let you get there. Page 43. Okay, here we go. Claudia and Jamie awoke very early the next morning. It was still dark. Their stomachs felt like tubes of toothpaste that had been squeezed all out. Ooh, that's a great metaphor. It's comparing their stomachs to toothpaste. That's a really good metaphor. Okay. Giant economy sized tubes. They had to be out of bed and out of sight before the museum staff came on duty. Neither was accustomed to getting up so early, to feeling so unwashed, or feeling so hungry. They dressed in silence. Each felt that peculiar chill that comes from getting up that early in the morning. The chill that must come from one's own bloodstream. For it comes in summer as well as winter, from some inside part of you that knows it is early morning. Okay, so think of a time that you have to wake up super, super early for something. I know sometimes when we go on trips and we have to get to the airport because we have that first flight, we have to get up at like 4 or 3 o'clock in the morning. It's super early. So think of a time maybe when you were camping or going on a trip. Or you had to go pick somebody up from somewhere and it was super early in the morning. You just feel just, you you know it's early. Your body knows that it's early. So I want you to think of a time where you felt that way. Okay, let's keep going. Bottom of page 43. Claudia always dreaded that brief moment when her pajamas were shed and her underwear was not yet on. Even before she began undressing, she always had her underwear laid out on the bed in the right direction. Right for getting into as quickly as possible. She did this now, too, but she hurried less, pulling her petticoat down over her head. She took good long whiffs of the wonderful essence of detergent and clean Dacron cotton, which floated down with the petticoat. Next to any kind of elegance, Claudia loved good, clean smells. After they were dressed, Claudia whispered to Jamie, Let's stash our book bags and instrument cases before we man our stations. They agreed to scatter their belongings. Thus, if the museum officials found one thing, they wouldn't necessarily find all. While still at home, they had removed all identification on their cases, as well as their clothing. Any child who has watched only one month's worth of television knows to do that much. Claudia hid her violin case in a sar sarcophagus that had no lid. It was well above eye level, and Jamie helped hoist her up so that she could reach it. It was a beautifully carved Roman marble sarcophagus. She hid her book bags behind a tapestry screen in the rooms of the French furniture. Okay, think of what is a sarcophagus. You've heard that word before. You're about to start studying Egypt and social studies. What do you think a sarcophagus is? If you're thinking of like a mummy and what a mummy is um, buried in, you're right. A sarcophagus is what they put um, mummies in. So the Egyptians used to carve out these very... Um, ornate or very decorative sarcophaguses and they're kind of like a um, what do we call them now a I'm totally blanking out on that word I don't know what we put people that have passed away in now when we put them in a ground in the ground I cannot believe I can't think of that word but anyways you know what I'm talking about but a sarcophagus is um, what they the Egyptians put their dead in put their mummies in Okay. 
Jamie wanted to hide his things in a mummy case, but Claudia said that that would be unnecessarily complicated. The Egyptian wing of the Metropolitan was too far away from their bedroom. For the number of risks involved, it might as well be Egypt. So the trumpet case was hidden inside a huge urn, and Jamie's book bag was neatly tucked behind a drape that was behind a statue from the Middle Ages. Unfortunately, the museum people had fastened all the drawers of their furniture so that they couldn't be opened. They had never given a thought to the convenience of Jamie Kincaid. Manning their stations meant climbing back into the booths and waiting during the perilous time when the museum was open to staff, but not to visitors. They washed up, combed their hair, and even brushed their teeth. Then began those long moments. That first morning, they weren't quite sure when the staff would arrive, so they hid good and early. While Claudia stood crouched down waiting, the emptiness and hollowness of all the museum corridors filled her stomach. She was starved. She spent her time trying not to remember delicious things to eat. Jamie made one slight error that morning. It was almost enough to be caught. When he heard the sound of running water, he assumed that some male visitor was using the men's restroom to wash up. He checked his watch and saw it was five past ten. He knew that the museum officially opened at ten o'clock, so he stepped down to walk out of his booth. It was not, however, a museum visitor who had turned on the water tap. It was a janitor filling his bucket. He was leaning down in the act of wringing out the mop when he saw Jamie's legs appear from nowhere and then saw Jamie emerge. Turning on page 46. Where did you come from, he added. Jamie smiled and nodded. Mother always says that I come from heaven. (laughs) He bowed politely and walked out, delighted with his brush and danger. He couldn't hardly wait to tell Claudia. Claudia chose not to be amused on an empty stomach. The museum restaurant wouldn't open until 11.30, and the snack bar wouldn't open until after that, so they left the museum to get breakfast. They went to the automat and used up a dollar's worth of Bruce's nickels. Jamie allotted ten nickels to Claudia and kept ten for himself. Jamie bought a cheese sandwich and coffee. After eating these, he felt hungry and told Claudia she could have 25 cents more for a pie if she wished. Claudia, who had eaten cereal and drunk apple and drunk pineapple juice, scolded him about the need to eat properly. Breakfast food for breakfast and lunch food for lunch. Jamie countered with complaints about Claudia's narrow mindedness. They were better organized that second day, knowing that they could not afford more than two meals a day. They stopped at a grocery and bought small packages of peanut butter crackers for the night. They hid them in various pockets in their clothing. They decided to join a school group for lunch at the snack bar. There were certainly enough to choose from. That way their faces would would always just be part of the crown. Upon their return to the museum, Claudia informed Jamie that they should take advantage of this wonderful opportunity that they had to learn and to study. We're at the top of page 47. No other children in all the world since the world had begun had such an opportunity. So she set forth for herself and her brother the task of learning everything about the museum, one thing at a time. Okay, we have our parentheses, so this is a detail that Miss Basil E. Frankenweiler is telling us. Claudia probably didn't realize that the museum had over 365,000 works of art. Even if she had, she could not have been convinced that learning everything about everything was not possible. Her ambitions were as enormous and as multi-directional as the museum itself. Every day, they would pick a different gallery about which they would learn everything. He could pick first, so she would pick second, he third, and so on. Just like the television television schedule at home. So as we're learning about everything that they're doing, do you think now that maybe Jamie feels a little bit of injustice? Because to me, it looks as though Claudia is setting a lot of the same rules that they have at home. What are some of the rules that Claudia is setting? She's saying um, what kind of foods they can eat when, right? She's setting a schedule for who picks when for their um, for their learning schedule. And she's also making sure that they learn. So it kind of, to me, it seems that now Jamie might feel a little bit of injustice. Jamie considered learning something every day outrageous. He was not... It was not only outrageous, it was unnecessary. Claudia simply did not know how to escape. He thought he would put a quick end to this part of their runaway career. He chose the galleries of Italian Renaissance. He didn't even know what the Renaissance was, except that it sounded important, and there seemed to be an awful lot of it. He figured that Claudia would soon give up in despair. 
When she gave Jamie first pick, Claudia had been certain that he would choose arms and armor. She herself found those interesting. There was probably two days' worth of learning there. Perhaps she might even choose the same on the second day. Okay, so on page, on the next two pages, so after page 47, there's a map of the museum, a map of the main floor, and a map of the second floor. So what I want you to do first is we know that they're staying in the um, English Renaissance part of the museum, right, where they have all the furniture. So can you find that on your map? English Renaissance. I'm looking. I see Italian Renaissance. I see English 18th century. I'm wondering if that's it right there. I bet that's it. And that's on that second page. I want you to look and I also want you to find a place that you think would be a cool place to run away. I think I might want to be close to the restaurant so you could always like maybe sneak in food. But just be looking at places you might stay. Okay, let's keep reading. Page 50. Claudia was surprised at Jamie's choice, but she thought she knew why he chose Italian re Renaissance. She thought she knew because along with tennis, ballet, and diving lessons at the Y, she had taken art appreciation lessons last year. Her art teacher had said that the Renaissance was a period of glorification of the human form. As best she could figure out, that meant bare bodies. Many painters of the Italian Renaissance had painted huge, billowy, blossomy, naked ladies. She was amazed at Jamie. She thought he was too young for that. He was. She never even considered the possibility that he wanted her to be bored. She had given him first choice, and she was stuck with it. So she marched him towards the long, wide stairway straight in from the main entrance, which leads directly to the Hall of Italian Renaissance. If you think of doing something in New York City, you can be certain that at least 2,000 other people would have thought the same thought. And of the 2,000 who do, about 1,000 will be standing in line waiting to do it. That day was no exception. There were at least a thousand people waiting in line to see things at the Hall of Italian Renaissance. Claudia and Jamie did not think that there was anything unusual about the size of the crowd. This was New York. Crowded was part of the definition of New York. Okay, we have our parentheses. To many art experts, Saxonburg, crowded is part of the definition of Italian Renaissance, too. It was a time much like this. Artistic activity was everywhere. Keeping track of artists of the 15th and 16th centuries in Italy is as difficult as keeping track of the tax laws in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, and almost as complicated. So she's telling Saxonburg that keeping track of all the artists in the Italian Renaissance is like for him to keep up with the laws of taxes in the 50s and 60s. So in the time about when they are. Okay. We're close to the top of page 51. As they reached the top of the stairs, a guard said, Line forms to the right, single file, please. They did as they were told, partly because they didn't want to offend any guard or even attract his attention, and partly because the crowd made them. Ladies' arms draped with pocketbooks and men's arms draped with coats formed a barrier as difficult to get through as barbed wire. Claudia and Jamie stood in the manner of all children who were standing in line. They stood leaning back with their necks stretched and their heads tilted away, way back, making a vain effort to see over their shoulders of the tall adult who always appears in front of them. Jamie could see nothing but the coat of the man in front of him. Claudia could see nothing but a piece of Jamie's head, plus the coat of the man in front of Jamie. They realized they were approaching something out of the ordinary when they saw a newspaper cameraman walking along the edge of the crowd. The newsman carried a large black flash camera, which had time stenciled on its white case. Jamie tried to slow down to the pace of the photographer. He didn't know what he was having his picture taken for, but he liked getting his picture taken, especially for a newspaper. Okay, we're going to stop right there before we move to part two. Okay, so Jamie thinks he's about to get his picture taken. I want you to start thinking about all the complications that this picture could have on Jamie and Claudia. So we're stopping at the top of page 52, and you need to go ahead and go back to Shobi and click, click the link for part two. Okay.